When we think of our lives in the future, we often imagine everything being different. But will it unfold this way? We'll find ourselves in new places, but maybe things that enrich the human spirit will remain the same. Since human beings first gazed at the moon and stars, we have wondered, what is beyond our Earth? People were dreaming about doing this for, you know, probably like 3,000 years. <laughs> How are we going to get to the moon? It took thousands of years, but eventually the dream was realized. Four decades later, we aspire to travel away from the Earth again. But why? In part to satisfy our desire for exploration. And perhaps we'll find new riches in space. And here at home, threats of war, environmental catastrophe, pandemic, or even an asteroid hit may require us to leave the planet to ensure the human race will survive. The real space race is whether or not we colonize off our planet before we go extinct. The battle for supremacy once set by the space race has given way to a new era of international cooperation. Putting a man on the moon remains one of humanity's greatest achievements. That's one small step for man. We'd like to return but it may not be as easy as it was in the Cold War. No government has the resources to fund space exploration. They're struggling already with minor missions. New missions that would lead us to space colonization will be a mammoth challenge, one greater than anything we've ever undertaken. Uh, that's going to be a costly endeavor. It's going to take a long time, and it's going to be risky. You know, it's going to take a while to, to figure out how to do it. Like most aspects of our lives, space technology is evolving to empower our exploration. The moon and Mars are within our sights, as are the stars, where we would take civilization to worlds that are light years beyond our own. If we do not, we may be doomed to extinction, trapped on this earthly sphere. Many of our most pressing terrestrial problems can be solved only by going into space. Long before it was a vanishing commodity, the wilderness as the preservation of the world was proclaimed by Thoreau. In the new wilderness of the solar system may lie the future preservation of mankind. Today we set a new course for America's space program, human missions to Mars and to worlds beyond. The dream is alive yet again, this time with the same inspiration that ignited our first manned rockets at liftoff almost a half century ago. There's a uniquely human drive to explore, I think. We've always wanted to know what's on top of that mountain, what's at the bottom of that sea, what's out in space. In those early days, it seemed a galaxy of possibilities awaited us. Space was the rage. It seemed to touch almost every aspect of life and culture. As a kid, you know, they're all fascinated with space, and you know, we've been reading uh, comic books and stories for over a century about people going off to other planets. If exploration is the dream of individuals, then colonization would be the dream of nations. When countries charted their way to new lands, it was often to expand their influence and wealth, just as it was for the Americans and the Soviets, when racing to space yielded more than just national bragging rights. The crucial drive for military and political supremacy propelled a man to the moon. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the earth. One giant leap for mankind. There was a wartime atmosphere, if you will. We were determined to achieve that goal, so I, I think we need a goal today. J.R. Gott is an astrophysicist at Princeton University who was concerned the space program could end within a generation. 
He feels we have many reasons to now go beyond Apollo and put the cowboys back in space. Colonize, multiply, spread out. That's the way life has survived. So it's a survival instinct, really, that gives us this feeling of curiosity and wanting to explore. So I think survival is the, is the important reason to do the manned spaceflight program. And, and that's something worth spending billions of dollars for. Few of us were thinking about colonization when the space shuttle and international space station programs ascended into orbit. Space travel almost seemed to be routine until disaster struck STS Challenger. We were reacquainted with the technical complexity of space travel, the expense and the risk to human life. Although delayed for three years, development of a space home in Earth orbit continued. There's a lot of different research that goes on in space and aboard the space station. I don't think we can imagine the, the benefits. The biggest benefit may be one we don't even see yet. Leroy Chow is among the few humans who have spent extended periods of time in space. One of his missions lasted more than six months and provided critical research in determining long-term effects for those who would become space colonists. Astronaut Chow has never lost sight of the importance of human exploration. Columbus, of course, fundamentally was an explorer and wanted to see what was out there. He discovered the Americas, and look what came out of that. I mean, the economic impact of that discovery is still being felt today. Guess what they were looking for when they found America? They were looking for gold, and we will be looking for gold in space, literally. Dr. Benny Pizer is a fellow of the Royal Astronomical Society and is among a select few who have an asteroid named in his honor. The big benefit of space travel will be an economic benefit. There are trillions of dollars worth of minerals that can be used. Platinum, gold, precious metals, they are out there. So space exploration will only thrive if there's a real economic incentive to do it. The economic benefits from space research have touched our lives for years and don't only come from what we discover in space, but also from what it takes to get there. Constellation, NASA's return to human spaceflight beyond Earth orbit to take us back to the moon. The first mission is planned for no later than 2014. The Orion spacecraft can support its crew for up to six months. Eventually, it could take us to Mars, possibly even an asteroid. But there are good reasons for testing the technology close to home. The moon is an ideal test bed for everything you're going to do on Mars. It's an ideal test bed for your spacecraft, your landers, your habitat, your rovers, your spacesuits, your tools. Better to do it on the moon. You're only about three days away from the Earth as opposed to Mars where you're six months or more away. Exploration with robotic spacecraft has given us clues about how we might harvest things from these extreme environments. We obviously can't bring enough air, food or water to sustain life, so we're looking for ways to tap into the power and resources that are there. Water is one of the most critical things behind oxygen of uh, sustaining human life in, in space or anywhere else, uh, so it is a critical resource. With the capabilities we have now, if we, for instance, were able to just go do it, we could actually accomplish quite a bit in just 10 years. It's an astounding amount of things we can do in just 10 years. Ed McCullough is a chemical engineer who has consulted extensively on the feasibility of permanent settlements on both the Moon and Mars. He believes that there is good reason to first establish a base on the Moon using its raw materials. If you go to the equator of the Moon, pick up a cubic meter of lunar regolith and heat it up, a kilogram of steam is going to come out. So even at the equator on the moon, you can get water. We can actually pull these rocks apart and get metal, ceramics, fibers, powders, glasses. We just look at ourselves as like the hardware store on the moon. The new lunar expeditions will enable us to begin stocking the shelves with materials that will lead to staking a claim on the red planet. You're going to build something to go to Mars, and you're going to have something that's quite large. Because there's an argument over whether or not you're going to launch all those things from the Earth with thousands of launches, or you're going to launch them from the Moon with launches that are much easier to do and a whole lot less energy. But you have to have the processing facility on the Moon. 
Supporting human life by consuming less of our earthly resources is the kind of thinking that can help ensure our survival. There is a growing belief in the advantages of continuing these forward steps for humankind. The real economic benefit of space is the amazing cheapness of colonization. You send a few astronauts and they, using indigenous materials, multiply their numbers and make a whole civilization. It's the world's biggest bargain. Three days to the moon, eight months to Mars, trips that will push us to new frontiers of technology and our capacity as humans. But Mars may hold special possibilities because it has more basic elements to sustain human life. Some research suggests heading directly there might be a smarter idea. We know there's permafrost there, so you've got water on Mars, you've got oxygen on Mars and so forth, so we could build our space colony on Mars. We have landed remote-controlled probes there for over 30 years and have assembled a wealth of knowledge that would help future missions. Others think we could leave the early development of Mars to intelligent machines because they require much less to keep them going. The, the best kind of robot to explore Mars would really be an intelligent robot that was even self-conscious. This is the goal of artificial intelligence. And even better than this would be a self-reproducing robot. And then he'll multiply there and give you more robots to explore. Well, gee, human beings are that kind of robot. But making a human footprint on the planet has never gone beyond the stories of science fiction.